Hello everybody. My name is Tony Suttle. I've been a guide and occasional lecturer for the past six years or so at the Dublin City Gallery, the Hugh Lane. This lecture on the French artist A.L. Barry's painting Forest at Fontainebleau is part of the gallery's long-running Wednesday morning coffee conversation talks. Before COVID, these coffee conversations took place in the gallery on Parnell Square and were followed by coffee and a chat about the work discussed and many other topics. My approach on those occasions was to be somewhat discursive, to ask questions of the coffee conversation group and to offer my views as just one approach to a variety of opinions. In this pre-recorded presentation, I will try to retain some of that approach and will suggest some ideas and questions to you, which, while we can't discuss them here and now, you might like to think about and, ideally, bring to mind when you next visit the gallery and can view Barry's painting for yourselves. It's currently hanging as part of the Lane Legacy Exhibition, which seeks to replicate the opening exhibition of the gallery in Dublin in 1908, in its then premises on Hockert Street. Let's start by looking at the work itself and asking ourselves, do you like it? And if so, why particularly, or perhaps why not? Now, we might ask ourselves, what is landscape and why paint it? Now, I must admit, when I met it first on the wall of the gallery, it did not attract my attention. The subject matter had little immediate appeal and I had never heard of A.L. Barry and I asked myself the question, whoever he was, why did he paint it? Now, let me first remove myself from the screen so you can focus on the images of the pictures themselves. Now, what is landscape and why paint it? First, however, we might ask ourselves um, about the importance of relative importance of landscape. In the classical five point academic hierarchy of painterly subject matter, landscape rated second in importance after history painting. But landscape painting can be said to come with a wide range of agenda and can be used for a variety of objectives. Here in the 16th century, Raphael in the painting, St. John the Baptist preaching, the landscape is very much background in an interesting composition, Raphael places St. John, the central figure of the picture's narrative, off to the right, slightly elevated. Listening to him with very varying levels of attention is a mixed crowd, arranged across the work, almost as in an antique carved frieze. Behind the crowd, the landscape curves over their heads, the row of trees on the skyline carrying our eyes across the picture to the figure of John the Baptist, whose words perhaps are also going above their heads. And here in the Mona Lisa, Leonardo da Vinci has used landscape again as a background and again as a means to an end. To give a sense of scale behind the sitter and as a contrast to his rendering of the flesh tones of the sitter's skin and the fabrics of her clothing, he has chosen to use a landscape background rather than the more conventional use of attributes indicating the status, wealth, or interests of the sitter. This work, The Tempest by Giorgione, is sometimes considered the first real landscape, where, as opposed to providing background, the landscape itself is the main subject matter. Giorgione draws us into the work with its geometric symmetry, its balancing of male and female figures, a dividing waterway and its bridge linking the two halves of the painting and its sense of impending storm. Possibly allegorical, art historians have been discussing possible interpretations of this work almost since its creation in the early 1500s. This is a typical work by the French-born painter Claude Lorraine. He has given it a nominal narrative by its title, Landscape with Hagar and the Angel and by the insertion of the small figures of Hagar and the angel in the lower left foreground, but his real focus is the landscape itself. While Claude Lorraine did drawings from nature of actual landscape, 
and components such as foliage, ancient buildings and so on. His paintings are idyllic, created by him to make a harmonious and balanced composition. He was a major influence, not only on landscape painting, but on the creation of the landscape itself, notably in the case of British landowners, who, having purchased his paintings whilst at Rome, perhaps as part of a grand tour, would return to their estates and reshape them along the lines of their Claude Lorraine paintings. This is a painting by the Irish landscape painter Thomas Roberts of Slane Castle, looking much as it is today. A large part of the purpose of this painting is an expression of ownership. The composition is balanced by the large trees, on, or the large tree on the right hand side, which may or may not have existed in reality. Beneath the tree are some small figures, referred to as staffage, to animate the work and to give scale to the landscape and so to Slane Castle itself. Again, this work in our National Galleries collection, A View of Dublin from Chapel Izzard, is by William Ashford and is very much about ownership. In this case, not so much private ownership as with Slane Castle, but political and military ownership. He was commissioned by the then Viceroy of Ireland, Earl of Camden, Earl Camden, who of course lived in the Phoenix Park in what is now Oris and Uchtaron. While it may look like a classic Claudian landscape, with the large tree to the left, the stag filling in for human staffage, and giving scale and animation to that lower left-hand corner, and the Liffey flying through the centre of the painting. It can also, however, be seen as being all about British colonial mapping and ownership of the city of Dublin. To the right, it shows the Royal Hospital at Kilmainham, a hospital for the military, and also in its grounds, a prison. And on the hill slope on the left, through the trees, is the military arsenal. And below that, we can see a company of soldiers accompanying a horse-drawn cart, bringing supplies up to the arsenal. Perhaps a less than idyllic landscape. I suggest it is a landscape with a definite agenda. So, apart from their own intrinsic beauty and interest, landscapes can be viewed in a wide variety uh, of ways. So why perhaps was this work, Barry's work, Barry's Forest at Fontainebleau, painted? So let us look briefly at A.L. Barry and why he might have made this work. And as you see, it shows a rocky outcrop and a density of trees in the forest of Fontainebleau on the outskirts of Paris. The only sign of life that I've been able to discern is a solitary bird flying overhead. Now, I must admit that before being asked to give this coffee lecture, I had passed by this work here in the current Lane Legacy recreation of Hugh Lane's first exhibition in the then newly opened Gallery of Modern Art on Harcourt Street. I didn't much like it. The painting seemed dark and gloomy with a very cluttered and busy composition, and to my eyes, uninspiring subject matter. And also, who was Barry? I was not familiar with the name. That's not particularly significant. I'm continually being introduced to new names and finding new pleasure in their work. Meeting Barry for the first time with this work, I was not optimistic. So who and what? was A.L. Antoine-Louis Barry, and why perhaps did he paint this work? Of course, the moment I googled Barry, my eyes were opened, and I discovered that he had a huge reputation in the late 19th and early 20th century, not primarily as a painter, but as a sculptor, working mainly as an animalier, that is a sculpture or a sculptor of animal figures. He is best known for his small tabletop works, but worked also on large-scale public works along the same animal-based scenes. So why did he paint this landscape? Throughout his career, he was a prodigious draftsman, making thousands of drawings, primarily of animals in movement, but also of their anatomical details. He also painted, becoming an active member of the Barbizon School of Plein Air Artists. However, he rarely exhibited his paintings during his lifetime. And as I searched the internet for examples of his work, I found a huge number of his small animal works, sculptures, a large number of drawings, but relatively few paintings. So, who was Barry? 
This is a posthumous portrait of Barry, painted 10 years after his death by a well-known portraitist, Léon Bonnard, based on a photograph of Barry by the French photographer Nadar. The photograph had been taken by Nadar when Barry was in his 60s. You may remember, Nadar was the photographer in whose studio premises the first Impressionist exhibition was organized. If you look carefully to the left of the portrait, you can see a wax model of the figure of a lion, a typical example of Barry's work. Barry was described by his contemporaries as a notably taciturn man who, although he taught drawing, rarely spoke to his students, correcting their work simply by retouching. A contemporary description of his character was, the overall effect is of self-contained, if melancholy, dignity of a man who has survived adversity and is beholden to no one. Barry was born in Paris and despite the exotic nature of much of his work, spent most of his life there. Initially, he served a number of apprenticeships, first with his father and with other goldsmiths, sculptors and painters. He studied for a while with the neoclassical artist Baron Gros, himself a student of the neoclassical painter Jacques-Louis David. Barry entered the École de Beaux-Arts in his early 20s and won a number of prizes with a range of types of largely sculptural work, both large and small. However, following visits to the Jardin des Plantes, Paris's botanic gardens, which also contained a zoo, he discovered what was to become his main topic of interest, the sculpting of animals, notably in the form of small tabletop statuettes. This interest in drawing animals, in Barry's case, almost an obsession, was one he shared with the French Romantic painter Eugène Delacroix. A pair of them met regularly at the Jardin des Plantes, zoo, to sketch the animals there, both living and following autopsies of dead animals, as the collection also served as a teaching facility for veterinary and medical students. Here are some examples of his drawings, mostly graphic, uh, graphite on paper. This almost classically academic style drawing of an elephant is from the Frick collection in New York. This more technical anatomical drawing of a dead elephant illustrates in Barry's interest in the anatomy of his subjects and his practice of attending animal autopsies at the zoo of the Jardin des Plantes. This image comes from the Walters Museum in Baltimore, Maryland, USA, which has a remarkable collection of Barry's work. Its website is well worth a browse. This image also comes from the Walters Museum collection with a different objective to the previous two images. This one, I feel, has a lovely, almost impressionist lightness and looseness in its capturing of the animal's movement. This watercolor by Barry uh, from the Huntington Museum in Virginia is interesting in that he has placed his subject against a landscape background. And this painting, Oil on Canvas, from the collection of the Metropolitan Museum, Museum in New York, again shows his subject against a landscape background, a loosely defined set of rocky outcrops. This work, one of Barry's frequent subjects, a lion and a large snake, again from the American Walters Art Museum, showed a wide, shows a wider landscape background. As with the two previous tiger paintings, you will notice the rocky outcrop as a feature of the background landscape. The landscape, however, is totally subservient to Barry's main focus, the confrontation of the two animals, lion and python. He gives each of the two animals their own distinct personality, a characteristic of Barry's work, both in his sculptures and much of his graphic work. You will have noticed in these three paintings that Barry's focus is very much on his animal subjects the background landscape is somewhat ill-defined and in the sense that it could be anywhere and whatever else is not necessarily a botanically accurate tropical scene. This is another Barry landscape, oil on canvas, from the Brooklyn Museum in New York. As with our own painting, it is titled Forest at Fontainebleau and shows a mix of vegetation and a rocky outcrop 
one of several such rock formations in the Fontainebleau area. Here again is our own forest at Fontainebleau, where, as with his animal figures, Barry studies what was available to him in Paris and captures its reality in paint, as he did his animals in bronze. As with his near contemporaries, Delacroix and Jericho, Barry was part of a transition in art from the neoclassical artists such as David and Baron Gros through the Romantics towards a more graphically realistic approach. While he aspired to make large public sculptural works, the main demand for his work tended to be for his smaller tabletop sized pieces. His anatomical accuracy and the animated poses of his subject matter began to appeal to a growing number of supporters, but not initially to the Academy and the selection panels of the Salon. They felt that his overly naturalistic animals departed from classical models. They coined the term animalia as a form of contempt for Barry's style, but it quickly became an accepted term for a popular and well-regarded art form, much as happened in the case of the term impressionist. It could be said that Barry's work, notably his smaller works, falls into a category which, which, which fits into the argument as to the distinction between fine art and decorator, decorative art, a discussion which continues today. In 1989, Barry's son was born and he also started his own business. Both events turned out to have significant impacts on Barry's professional career. Following the rejection of his submissions to the annual Salon in 1837, Barry ceased submitting his work for the next 10 years. Now, there was a fashion in 19th century France for animal studies. Bronzes could now be mass produced and the growing middle class was keen to collect luxury goods. Barry was the first and foremost of the sculptors who specialized in this genre. Deciding to go directly to his public, in 1839, he borrowed money and established his own workshop and supervising the casting of his models. However, he proved to be a poor business person and after nine years was declared bankrupt in 1848. All of his work and molds were sold to a foundry. This foundry began making inferior versions of his works from 1848 to 1857, and Barry's reputation suffered during this time. However, after 10 years, his financial circumstances improved and he recovered control of his output. In due course, his son Alfred, following in his father's footsteps, also became a competent animalier sculptor. Struggling in the context of the popularity of his father's reputation, he, the son, signed his work as A. Barry. This did not please his father, who then insisted on his son signing his own work as either Alf Barry or as A. Barry Fies, Barry's son. Barry Sr. always signed his own work simply as Barry. In 1854, he was appointed Professor of Drawing at the Museum of Natural History. However, despite his business problems, Barry continued to have his patrons and supporters, including the then Duke d'Orléans, who provided commissions both for sculptures and for luxury decorative tableware. The Duke had also been instrumental in having Barry appointed as a member of the Légion d'Honneur in 1833. On the strength of that, Barry was able to buy a house in the Barbizon area, close to Fontainebleau, where he joined the Barbizon group of painters, who in part were influenced by the British painter Constable, whose work had been exhibited successfully at the Paris Salon in 1824. Their more realistic approach to art matched Barry's own approach to his animal sculptures, with his combination of dramatic action in his depiction of animal life, based, however, on his close observation, study of anatomy, and sound draftsmanship. While he made about 200 odd paintings, he did not exhibit them, showing them only to his friends and fellow artists until they were exhibited and sold after his death. Throughout his life, however, he had made innumerable sketches and drawings, studies for subsequent sculptures, often showing his animal subjects in apparently exotic backgrounds, which were, however, largely derived from his imagination and the landscapes of Fontainebleau and Barbizon. Slowly, slowly, Barry's work began to be more accepted uh, and acceptable to the academic authorities, 
and a number of his works were shown in the Paris Song of 1850, causing the writer and critic Théophile Gautier to observe, the mere reproduction of nature does not constitute art. Barry aggrandizes his animal subjects, simplifying them, idealizing them, and stylizing them in a manner that is bold, energetic, and rugged, that makes him the Michelangelo of the menagerie. These are some examples of Barry's animal sculptures. This lion and snake is a large scale work in the Louvre collection. You can see the, uh, some of the other pieces in the Louvre collection where it's on display in the background. It was originally located outside the museum. At the time, due to the extremely natural, naturalistic rendering of both animals, the lion and in the foreground, the serpent or snake, um, the violence of the struggle depicted, the sculpture caused a huge controversy. Conservative critics complained that with this and similar works, the Tuileries Gardens were being turned into a zoo. Here is a smaller version on the same theme, again, from the Walters Museum in the States. And this is a somewhat more restrained small piece from the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. It's probably a sketch model for a line in the Tuileries Gardens. It's probably unique and maybe an artist's proof rather than an addition bronze. Very strong modeling and finishing contribute to its quality. This line devouring a doe is one of the two small Barry sculptures in our National Gallery, part of its Lane bequest in 1918, following Lane's death. This tiger devouring a gazelle is the second of the two small Barry pieces in our Dublin National Gallery, part of the Lane bequest. There is an example of this piece, Greyhound with a Dead Hair, in both the Victoria and Albert Museum in London and in the Ulster Museum collections. I suggest it demonstrates the level of realism that Barry brings to his work and which upset the more conservative critics of his day. It also allows the influence of the close attention and observation he brings to anatomical detail in his subject matter. And this is an example of Barry's decorative table work from the Louvre Museum a pair of nine branch candelabra on a classical theme in a late Renaissance manner of style. Barry's work became increasingly popular, notably in North America, and eventually also his acceptability increased in critical terms, and he was made a member of the Academy in 1868. However, perhaps as indicative of Barry's popularity at this stage of his career is a quotation from the popular novel the Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas, describing the collection of one of the book's characters, a wealthy young man about town at a moment of crisis. Then he arranged all his beautiful Turkish arms, his fine English guns, his Japanese china, his cups mounted in silver, his artistic bronzes, bronzes by Fouchere and Barry, all the pocket money he had about him and then he made an exact inventory of everything. While Barry's work has somewhat fallen out of favor uh, with much of contemporary critical comment, an indication of his reputation is indicated by the fact that he has a small public park, Park Barry, named after him, located on the Ile Saint-Louis on the Seine in the center of Paris. Now, I suspect that the city of Paris authorities do not do their street and park naming casually. Park Barry is close to Barry, Barry's par, uh, Paris residence during his lifetime on the Quai des Célestins. The park contains a large memorial monument dedicated to Barry. The monument was erected in 1894 before the creation and naming of the park itself in the 1930s. Here we see the park with springtime cherry blossom and a children's play area in the background. The memorial includes a bas-relief portrait bust of Barry on its plinth and a replica of the lion and serpent sculpture from the Louvre in front of it. From the 1850s onwards, Barry's critical and population, uh, popular reputation grew rapidly, 
and his work can be now found all over the world in most of the great collections, art galleries, and museums. He was particularly popular in the United States, where, as I said, the Walters Art Gallery and Museum in Baltimore, Maryland, has a particularly strong collection of his work. He was elected, as I said, a member of the Academy in 1868, but produced no further new work from the following year, 1869. He died six years later, in 1875, and is buried in the Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris. This bust sculpture is uh, on his tomb. Checking the Art UK website of British collections, 24 works by Barry are listed in its national collections and national trust grant houses, including the Ulster Museum and the v &A. And of course, as we have seen, our own national gallery has two of Barry's typical small sculptural works part of the Hulane Bequest. And we have our Barry painting currently shared with the British National Gallery in London, whose website descri describes it as on display elsewhere. Can we speculate on why Hulane purchased this painting and possibly more significantly included it as one of the 39 paintings to come to Dublin? Coincidentally, Hulane was born in the same year as Barry's death. As Hugh Lane developed his career as an art lover and as an art dealer, I expect that he would have been well aware of Barry's work and popularity. Lane's interest in art stretched well beyond paintings, as Morna O'Neill describes in her book. Lane, in his combined home and gallery at Lindsay House in London, combined old masters, antiques, and oriental ceramics to create a delightful palace of art. In short, art does not exist merely as individual items to be bought and sold, but as part of a total experience and to be enjoyed in an overall context of other works of many types. So let us end on a more serious note as we began by looking again at Barry's landscape painting of a corner of the forest of Fontainebleau. I hope that you will be able to visit the gallery and look at the work directly rather than online. Do you perhaps find it more interesting than I did on my first viewing of it? I now try to view it as Hugh Lane might have done in the early years of the last century, when Barry's reputation was more immediate than today, though his work still attracts many followers. While fashions and ideas as to what is good or interesting art change, we are fortunate at the Hugh Lane to have this example of Barry's graphic work and to consider it in the context of his sculptural output, where, despite many setbacks and disappointments, he persevered in bringing alive his dramatic depictions of exotic animals in action. Barry showed nature, as in the poet Tennyson's word, red in tooth and claw, depicting creatures from all corners of the world without moving from Paris and its immediate environs. Thank you for joining me in this week's Coffee Conversation and in this quiet corner of the Hulane collection. And for the moment, goodbye.